emotional security. <coughs> Generally speaking, most observers, diplomats and historians, would acknowledge that the United States, Russia, and the world came close to the brink of nuclear annihilation during the Cold War and the Cuban Missile Crisis. The exercise of diplomacy, tact, and luck turned this aside 50 years ago this fall. Today, the number of known and suspected nuclear armed nations has increased many fold. What methods should be used today to deal with countries very different than the adversaries of the 1960s, <coughs> countries such as Iran and North Korea, who allegedly have or are ardently pursuing <coughs> nuclear capability? Three minutes apiece. We begin with Mr. Dunn. I'm not so sure that our adversaries are necessarily much different in their temperament. They're all sworn to undermine or destroy American society. It doesn't really matter where they come from, geographically or philosophically. And I think that where we were 50 years ago is not so different from where we are today. I think the methodologies have to change a little bit. I think we have to be a bit more creative with our diplomatic efforts because it's probably not as credible to treat directly with a country like North Korea today as it was to treat directly with the Soviet Union just 50 years ago. We did have a direct diplomatic relationship with the Soviet Union in the worst of times. And I think that's something we don't have with countries like Iran or North Korea that have probably much more flamboyantly radical views of what they see their purpose as as it is to exist as a nation and what they want to see as a result of the outcome of their pursuit of nuclear weapons or possession of nuclear weapons. Um, I believe that we do have strong diplomatic ties with many countries that do have a closer relationship with those nations. And I think we have to exploit those that are absolute pulse. A use of force uh, against a nuclear nation is a very, very risky proposition obvious results if we're not successful. And I would not at all want to see the United States go in the direction uh, of trying to strike out at another nation to eliminate its nuclear capacity. That was the theory that led many of us to go through exercises as school children of running down to the basement or hiding under your desk or other fruitless things that would only, if at all, delay the inevitable event of a nuclear attack. And in fact, this is sort of how my family wanted to name in the first place my mother's recurring nightmares of pushing a baby carriage through the crowded streets of Chicago during an air raid siren, or an air raid thrill, or the possibility of Russian bombers barreling in on in Chicago, Illinois. So they moved to a quiet little farm right in the flat, flight path of Dow Air Force Base. <laughs> <laughs> the reality is that with nuclear weapons, there is nowhere to hide. And I think our diplomatic efforts have to be focused on the, the best senses of our adversaries and their allies, that there is no tomorrow if we pull that trigger today. And that's what we have to focus our efforts, and that's what I would insist on as the United States Senate. Thank you, Mr. Dodd. Now in rotation, Ms. Dill, three minutes on the national security question. Thank you very much. When I was a freshman at the University of Vermont, <coughs> uh, the second semester of my freshman year, I was uh, a member of the non nuclear suite and it was uh, right around the time that uh, Ronald Reagan was being elected. And the study of the nuclear arms race at that time um, made an incredible impact on me as a person. I was incredibly um, afraid. And, um, and I'm still afraid. Uh, however, I feel that um, fear is part of the problem. <laughs> And as a United States Senator, I think, first of all, I, I think we just need to recognize there's too many nuclear weapons in the world. And we need to do our part to reduce the number of nuclear weapons. They're not effective any longer, given the current uh, enemy that we face uh, in terms of terrorists. Um, there are currently treaties that are in place that call for the reduction of nuclear arms that aren't being necessarily followed, and I believe that the United States should lead by example in reducing its nuclear arms and uh, working through uh, diplomacy to have other parties
parties to these treaties uh, reduce theirs. Um, and in terms of other nations uh, having nuclear um, weapons, I go back to an earlier statement I made, and that is that we certainly um, don't believe the mere presence of a nuclear weapon in another country justifies sending American children to fight uh, or to try to address that problem. Um, but I do think that steps can be taken, economic <coughs> sanctions can be taken, um, certainly education and empowerment of the people in these countries to take this issue on for themselves, to hopefully put in place leaders that can thoughtfully and strategically uh, address their own security concerns without the use of nuclear weapons. So um, I'm opposed to the proliferation of nuclear weapons. I believe that America has to lead by reducing our own number of nuclear weapons. And I would support um, an international effort to um, reduce the overall number and at the same time deal very sternly, but not necessarily uh, use force with the countries that are trying to gain independence. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Uh, and now in rotation, uh, Mr. Heap, the same question for three minutes. Uh, yes, thank you again. Uh, the nuclear proliferation question once again poses the uh, a problem both in the long term and the short term sense. Uh, the tougher question is the short term question. Some rogue state is threatening or actively going about acquiring nuclear weapons. What should the United States do? That's the harder question. So I'll put it later in case I run out of time. I, I, I won't get to that one. Uh, the long term question. Much more, uh, we should have much greater clarity on that. Uh, the, there is a nuclear non proliferation <laughs> treaty which was decided decades ago and entered into. The United States was driving behind it. <coughs> One of the things that's obvious about the nuclear non proliferation treaty is the non no, all the non nuclear states were not supposed to get nuclear weapons. However, there was another part to it, and that was the states, the countries with nuclear weapons, were supposed to build them back, go back and, and reduce the number and reduce the hair trigger mechanisms that has the world on the potential brink of a nuclear war. Uh, we slipped in our responsibility on that uh, during much of that time period, and yet we kept insisting that no countries acquire nuclear weapons for the first time. Uh, there has, over time, been progress made. A uh, nuclear test ban treaty was arrived at. My organization worked on that. I worked on it. Uh, we managed to get a worldwide nuclear test ban in place. Uh, news today uh, was a report indicating the United States is able to keep its arsenal uh, viable and tested without exploding nuclear bombs. This was a good step. Rem removing uh, the number of nuclear weapons that the superpowers had some of which occurred with the leadership of President Ronald Reagan, was a good step. Uh, if we take those kinds of steps, we have much greater moral authority to try and prevent the rogue states, the small countries, from getting nuclear weapons. Uh, I'll, I'll switch to that short-term question. The, the best way to control nuclear materials is to control fissile fuel, the stuff that's needed to make the nuclear weapons. You cannot keep the technology, the knowledge, from getting to the states. What you can uh, control is the fissile fuel. Uh, if a country is gaining that, which we're afraid Iran is, and we worry about the consequences of that, it poses a very difficult question. Um, I would not have a blanket rule how to deal with that question. I would be very concerned that there be overreach by a U.S. president in trying to address that in the same token. I think there needs to be latitude given that the commander in chief faced with such a situation. <coughs> Thank you, Mr. Mayor. And Mr. Paul, the same national security question. Your turn for three minutes. Thank you, Representative Adams. Um, you mentioned the anniversary of the Cuban Missile Crisis. Um, I wrote a paper when I was in college on the Cuban Missile Crisis, and many of you may not be able to see this, but I'm, I'm wearing a pin here. And this is a picture of John Kennedy, and it says, John Kennedy, our next president, this is from John Kennedy's presidential campaign. And when I was writing 
way in that paper that I learned about Senator Robert Kennedy, Senator Robert Kennedy's critical role in averting nuclear Armageddon by counseling his brother against the counsel of pretty much the entire cabinet to take China for strike against the, the Soviet Union. Um, many of you just, I'll take a few seconds to say, you may not all know this, but that America had placed Jupiter missiles in Turkey prior to the arrival of the missiles in Cuba, and that there was a secret agreement uh, between Kennedy and Khrushchev for Kennedy to remove those missiles in, as part of a deal between two uh, the crisis. Um, so, and that, I think, tends us to sign that we need to be very careful of any actions that can be perceived as uh, aggression on the part of America. Um, and, but in any case, um, I also, in the same class, wrote a paper on the nuclear arms race. And I read a book called The Fate of the Earth by Jonathan Shell, and I, I highly recommend it to all of you. It had a profound impact on me. And one of the quotes in that book is from Albert Einstein, and he said, the splitting of the atom has changed everything, save our way of thinking, and thus we drift toward unparalleled catastrophes. And what this says to me is that now that we have this technology that gives us the capability to end the world as we know it, we need to evolve as a human society beyond warfare as a means of settling disputes. We need to learn to embrace our common humanity and work together and realize we're all in this as one. And, and we have a planet which is on the verge of complete ecological collapse. We have people starving all around the world, and we need to come together and move beyond war as soon as possible. Um, one thing in particular regarding nuclear non-proliferation, I, I think I agree that we should reduce our stockpile. And I, my hope is that ultimately we destroy the the plans and the technology and the knowledge for how to create nuclear weapons, and that there's not taught in the university or anywhere secret. We have no nuclear reactors. I think we need to follow Germany's lead and close all nuclear power plants in America as soon as possible. The disaster in Japan has showed us how dangerous these small of energy is, and the fact that no insurance companies would insure this had it not been for government policies that exempted these from liability. Um, say there was an earthquake in Lisbon, you may not know this, in 1755, and this started a, I, I, I thought, maybe it was, um, and this sparked a tremendous amount of a re revolution in thinking and, and, and both air and enlightenment thinkers, because why would God have sent this earthquake and this tsunami that killed about 100,000 people in Libya? I hope that the silver lining of this disaster